Today we are so excited. Tommy, who is the normally the kind of crazy one up here doing, did you know? All that kind of stuff. And um, I tell you what, I think the world of this guy, he, it, you never find somebody who's always working. <laughs> he is a hard worker. He is just a, a prince of a man. He really is. I th I'm Tommy, I'm thankful for you. And I'm so thankful that we got a chance, because it's through Exalt that we got a chance to get to know each other. And I'm thankful to get to know you. Can you give him a hand? Tommy, come on up. All right. Well, thank you. Man, what a welcome. Well, thank you so much for that as well. Um, <clears throat> just want to welcome you guys in again. It is so awesome to have you all here this morning with us, whether you're joining us here or you are online. Can you give a big round of applause for the people joining us on the line this morning? Absolutely. I know uh, Pastor Tony spoke a lot about um, just being thankful and taking time and being with family. I'm hoping you ate a lot of turkey. Just a whole, there we go. You're my people. Whoever didn't make a noise, not my people. The turkey, I'm a nut. My wife literally said to me, we're on the ride home. She's like, how can you be so turkey? And I'm like, oh, wait, he said I wasn't going to do that today. Okay, anyway. So how can I be so turkey? I'm like, what are we talking about? I mean, even if it's a bad turkey, just put gravy on it. It's phenomenal. I hope you guys ate a lot of turkey. And then, yes, I hope you were thankful and you were around family and you had an awesome time this morning. We are glad to have you back with us this morning. Um, my name is Tommy. I'm one of the pastors here at Exalt Church. Pastor Roger and Laura are taken this weekend to just lay low, take it easy. Absolutely, they deserve it. And it is awesome to be able to come in and speak this morning. Um, I do want to take this moment um, just to highlight, to point out somebody that's with us this morning. Um, you know, somebody who is going out on a new adventure a different direction, Miss Kirsten Klein. She goes, no! Miss Klein is leaving Tuesday for boot camp. And I was asked to maybe give her a little bit of a hard time, which Amy Lane will tell you I am amazing at that. I'm really good at giving people hard times. But this morning, I'm not going to do that. What I am going to do is I'm going to say thank you for your commitment and thank you for your sacrifice. I can tell you, um, I was a gunner's mate missile tech. I know what that is to get on that plane and head to Chicago. I know what it is to be away from family. So many other service members that are with us this morning know that, and we thank you for it. We know how hard of a decision that is, and thank you guys for all the service members that are with us this morning. Can we give a big round of applause to her? Now, Kirsten, I am not going to reveal any of the secrets of boot camp to you. And I hope no one else has spoiled this for you. I hope that it is everything that the Navy has designed this to be. Um, two words I will say that you're going to become extremely familiar with is drop crew. You're going to hear that. Now, if you're anything like me, I was the most push-up doing person on the planet. Just push, 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 push. Run, 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 run. I mean, this is kind of my atmosphere. It never stops. You're constantly doing stuff. I mean, so get ready for that. The other one thing I will tell you, which does not have to do with boot camp, but could come in handy if you end up on training command, um, Great Lakes, there are no cats on training command, Great Lakes. Just so you know, those black and white things running around, they are not cats. So... <laughs> Okay, I can't just leave you hanging there. So anyway, um, the way this is designed is you have barracks, okay? And what they do is they do a mock ship. So inside you have a rover. Then you have a petty officer of the watch. He's standing at um, the quarter deck, and he's checking to make sure who's coming in. So the rovers inside are keeping it safe. I'm checking to see who's coming in. And then there's rovers outside, and they're making sure that nobody's bum-rushing the joint, right? So very strict. You know, you got to stand here for whatever your watch is. And, and that night... I was the petty officer to watch. I'm standing there and just checking IDs and everything. And out of nowhere, I hear this faint voice because it was so far away. Here, get it, get it, get it, get it. And I was like, what was that? Here, get it, get it, get it. And out of nowhere, I see this thing go running by. And then I see the rover come by. This, this female um, comes running past. And I'm thinking to myself, there are not any cats 
And I was like, oh, no. And I scream. I'm like, stop, stop. And it's just too late. She had gotten close enough. The skunk, the black and white thing is a skunk, has sprayed. And I get out there, and I'm like, whoa, you stay there. And the request was, now think about it, we're on duty, we have a job to do. The request was, can I go change? And I, I just had to say, no, you, you can't. You have to continue to rove like that. And this was like the middle of the watch. So here's my thing. Um, listen to what you're told, be obedient, and things won't stink. Um, anyway, so, da 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 that is horrible dad humor. I've got kids running all over the place. Anyway, thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, be safe in your journeys. Thank you, thank you. Um, and this morning's message could actually not be any more appropriate. Matter of fact, when I was asked to do that, I was like, I couldn't have made this up. Because this morning is about obedience. Okay? The message is obedience. I didn't think about that or write that when... I found out that information that you were leaving. It's just, I looked at my wife and I was like, great, this is easy. So obedience, resting in the Lord. That is the message this morning. I, and, and I truly hope that you guys had the ability to rest. Um, as Tony said, I am kind of the person who's constantly running around, doing the dance, working, all those kind of things. And rest can be, uh, it can be a considerable challenge for me. Um, Laura and I actually had quite a bit of rest here in the last couple weeks. Um, we've traveled from one place to another, another. We've stayed in different hotels and in-laws and stuff like that. And, you know, one thing we've noticed is that we've been wake, waking up not rested, really achy. And we came to the conclusion through being in all these other situations that our, our mattress is shot. So in order to get better rest... Our solution is buy a new mattress. So we did that this weekend. We went ahead and bought a new mattress, and uh, we're waiting for that to come in. Uh, as I said, we've been all over the place. Uh, we just got back from my in-laws, and this was an awesome time. Um, I don't know how anybody who was there could see that for me because I was asleep on a couch the majority of the time. And what tells me that I go a little too hard and a little too long and a little is that the second that I sit on a couch, <laughs> And Laura's like, well, you sleep the whole time. And I'm like, well, take the couch out of the room. I can't sit down. That's crazy. I'm out cold. But it was great to just unplug, disconnect. Um, prior to that, we had actually spent a week in Disney. So we've been gone for two weeks. This was a great vacation. And we actually designed it in a way that there were some breaks going down. There were breaks while we were there. So we weren't constantly going. So there was a considerable amount of actual rest, which if you guys did not know, Disney is the most expensive triathlon you will ever pay for. So you have to put breaks in this. Um, and we've learned that over the last couple trips. Prior to that, I got to go fishing. Now, I want you to understand why I'm talking about obedience and why I'm talking about resting. This message is not about backsliding. It's not about falling on your face. But I was disobedient. You see, a year ago, earlier, earlier, earlier this year, I really felt in my heart that God was telling me, rest, rest, just, just rest. But for me, I'm like, I'm not tired. I don't know, what am I, what am I breaking for? What does this even look like? What is this? And I, I've come to realize that God knew what was in front of me because right after that, our house fell apart. And everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong and I'm just charging through charging through charging through and finally I got to this place a couple weeks ago and I looked at Laura and I said you know what I'm going fishing for me rest may look a little bit different than it does for you and I got out there and the second I got up there I was in shorts I was in a fleece it was freezing cold and I felt the wind coming at my chest and immediately I was like yes and the reason why is because I'm a striper fisherman and that is the temperature you're looking for when you're going after striper. You want it to be brisk. You want it to be cool. For me, this is where I relax. I'm calm. I get up there and I talk to God. And I get up there and I'm fishing. And I lay into this striper just 
boom. That is the noise it made. And immediately I'm like, oh, I've got a winner. Oh, my goodness, i got a winner. And I bring this thing up. And I hadn't, I hadn't checked my drag on this pole in over a year. Hadn't done anything with it. And immediately, like, the reel's trying to pop off it. And the drag's all wrong. And I'm like, I'm going to miss this fish. And I'm going crazy. And I get this fish up. And I'm looking at this beautiful 24-inch, just football round striper. And immediately, I stopped. And I was like, this is what you wanted me to do? And I was like, thank you, Jesus, that literally he knew this is what, that moment, it's what, I mean, it brings the excitement, it brings the fire, it's a relaxation I cannot explain to you. For me, that I'm up there and I am in peace, and I'm like, wow, this is what you've been putting on my heart, is for me to rest. Now, for you, rest may take on many different definitions, it may look many different ways but I know for me in that moment I was called for this immediately everything kind of faded away and everything was awesome so this morning we're talking about obedience and we're talking about rest typically when you talk about re- uh, obedience uh, when you talk about rest you wouldn't be talking about uh, obedience you know when you're talking about obedience you might be talking about discipline or punishment. And this is a, just a piece of a bigger message on discipline and uh, on not discipline, obedience. So it's obedience resting in the Lord. And for me, when you talk about obedience, typically you're not talking about rest. You're talking about punishment. You're talking about discipline. Don't worry, you're going to get to know all about this, Kirsten, very soon. Um, but for me, in this moment, it's rest. It's being restful. We'll be navigating through a couple different types of rest, some of which I struggle with, some of which you guys may struggle with. What are different kinds of rest? One, the rest that refreshes your body. The rest that renews your mind. And the rest that renews your soul. You see, rest requires a commitment. It requires you to say, I'm going to rest. People who are always resting are called lazy. That's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about making a commitment to rest. It requires a commitment. I had, I had a buddy just a few months ago um, that we were doing something. I said, hey, I thought you were going to be there. And he back and said, nope, that's the day I sleep in. No intention of being there. And it was a commitment that, no, this is the day that I unplug, that I unwind. And for me, I have to do that. I have to say, you know what? I am doing this in order for me to rest. Rest requires obedience. We are all called to rest. We're called to rest. It's called the Sabbath. You know that there's, and while we're talking this morning, there's multiple different types of rest and ways we're going to talk about rest. It's the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Taking a rest, taking a break, the Sabbath falls in line with the principle of tithing. It's saying it takes a trust. It takes a trust in the Lord saying that I can do more with six days of the week than seven. That I can accomplish more with this amount of time than all the time. So when we make that commitment, this is a principle that when we apply it, We are rested. We're able to handle situations and tackle things and navigate things better. I had a buddy named Joel, and Joel was really big into tithing. He was really big into resting. He kept the Sabbath, and he said to me, you know, I give 10% of my money to the tithe. I give that to God. So I'm giving 10% of my day to him as well. So he said, every day I take 2.4 hours of my day, and I give it to God. And I'm like, that is awesome. That is great that you're doing that. And he would go out and he'd clean up people's yards and all this different stuff for people that can do it. And it was amazing. It was his commitment to say, I'm taking this time and I'm giving it to the Lord. It takes a commitment. There's companies in our local area as well as on a national uh, venue that take every Sunday off. They're closed. And based on how long the lines are around them every other day of the week, they're doing perfectly fine. (laughs) So (laughs) take a break. Take a rest. And this is a major corporation. 
The line is longer at their stores than anywhere else on the planet. They take Sundays off, and they are busy as all get out. They have a commitment to do that, and they stand by it. So here's the deal. Resting displays a trust and a faith in God. We see it in the very, very beginning of Scripture. In the beginning, God did all these things. On the first day, light was created. On the second day, the sky was created. The third day, dry land, seas, plants, trees were all created. The fourth day, the sun, moon, and stars were created. On the fifth day, creatures that live in the sea and creatures that fly were created. And on the sixth day, animals that live on the land and finally humans made in the form of God were created. And the image of God were were created. I'm going through these days for a reason. I'm going to come back to it at the end of the message. The seventh day, though, God rests. We find it in Genesis 2, verse 1 through 3. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. In this scripture, he is resting from what he is doing. He is stopping. This is the part that I struggle with. That there's, I'm constantly going and going and going. There's always something to be done. I know just a week ago, I was like, you know, there's more good that could be done. And I was reminded that. Yeah, you know, between being a husband and a father, running a business, being a pastor. Yeah, yep, find somewhere to put that more good in there. But there's always more good to be done. There's always more that we can do. But right here, it's saying stop, rest. This is what I struggle with. When me and my wife, Laura, first got married, we were at a church that one of the people came up to her and said, does that man ever stop moving And she was like, no. And the response was, he's going to be twitching in his coffin. He just never stops. I can't stop. I just go, go. There's always something. And that may be a true statement. I don't know. Run. Run. (laughs) There's any twitching. Run. (laughs) This is really creepy. For me, it's the actual day of stopping and resting. It's slowing down and just resting. For some, where we talk about rest for the body. The second one is that we can rest with our mind. There's a lot of people that struggle with this. The renewing of the mind. They struggle with just stopping and letting things become fresh and new. The Bible says this in Romans 12 too, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. That we have to rest our minds. You know, I had a thing that I've been pressuring on me, heavy, heavy, heavy. To be transparent, I really didn't know what decision and direction to make. And here we are sitting in Florida, and we're in Orlando, taking this deep breath, and just very easily in the morning... The solution came to me. Clear as day. This is the right direction. But I had to stop, and I had to see which way to go. I had to stop everything from around me from moving. And like I said, in Orlando, there was a lot of this. Now, like I said, me resting may look a little bit different for you guys. For me, a lot of times, this is a big enough rest. I used to do a message every Wednesday night, and that's actually how I would start the message that everybody would come in, and we would take a deep breath in. You cannot do this right now. There's things that are in place that you can't breathe in, breathe out. You also can't cough in public or any of those things. Um, So we would start the message, and you'd take a deep breath in and let it back out. Because I knew that we were coming into a time where we were going to learn about the Lord, and this is not something. I know when I hadn't been to church in forever, I came in, and I was like, oh, my God, what in the world is about to happen, and the place is going to burn down, and... And I walked in, and I was like, 
man. So every time I did that message, I would do that. For me, a lot of times, that's all the rest I need. But it's not just, it's literally this brief moment where I disconnect from the whole entire world. So I'm laying alongside a pool, which if you guys ever wonder what laying alongside a pool looks like for me, having three children. It's me laying in this lawn chair, just straight back, relaxed. I'm taking my deep breath. One eye opens and says, Logan, don't kill your sister. <sighs> Lily, let go of your brother. <laughs> Logan, you're going to drown her. This is what rest alongside a pool with three kids is. But then by scanning the room and the area I was in, I was able to see that there were four lifeguards in this very little area. And I was like, kill her! <laughs> no, not really. He'll save you. He's going to save her. The lifeguard's going to save her. So I was able to take this deep breath, and I was able to relax right there in that moment. We need time to rest our bodies. We need time to rest our minds. The first rest that we saw was God taking a rest from what he did. A lot of times the rest that we are doing is we're taking a rest from what we did, what we've done, the work week, um, the hard day's work, that glass of lemonade when we're mowing the lawn on a hot summer day and we sit out on the porch. Man, doesn't that sound really, really good? I need to do that more often. Have that glass of lemonade, relax, disconnect, unplug. A lot of times when we're relaxing, it's from what we have done. So what does obedience have to do with all this? Like I said, you have to make a commitment. You have to make a decision that you're going to disconnect. You're going to unplug. In Luke 5, verse 4 and through 11, they'll put this up on the screen. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let the nets down for a catch. Okay, so this is Jesus. And Simon answered, But God, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. I need to unpackage this for you for a minute. Because every time I used to read this early on, I was like, well, they went out and they caught all these fish. You know, first off, the response is, but we have fished all night long. You could break it down at that point. I'm a fisherman, you're a rabbi. Let's go a little bit further. I'm a fisherman, pre-rabbi, you're a carpenter. Okay? And you're telling me how to fish. I've been out all night, and I don't have fish. What if this story stopped right here? We would not know Peter. We would know Simon. And when we knew Simon, they'll say, well, who's Simon? He's the guy that told Jesus to go build a boat. Because he was a carpenter. And instead, because of this next motion, we know Peter to be who he actually is now in our history. We haven't caught anything all night, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. So they go out and they let down these nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. It would be very easy to read past this and say, okay, he listened to God and he had a boat overflowing with fish. It's like I listened to God. I went up on that bridge. I caught this beautiful 24-inch striper, right? But you have to slow down for a minute because that's not what's happening here. You see, when I go striper fishing... Here's a couple things you need to know. I go fishing at night. I'm a night fisherman. And the reason I go fishing at night is because there is light that casts on the water. And I also go when the tide is coming in or going out because I know that the bait fish are being washed in or pulled out. And as this is taking place, the striper are standing right in that shadow. Okay? And when that bait fish comes by, he's got it. So here's the thing, when it comes to me catching a fish, and I say, man, I went fishing and I caught a fish, there's so much more that goes behind that. For one, I looked at what the tides were, I looked what the activity was going to be for that day, 
I looked at what the moon was setting at. There's all these different things. Temperature, what part of the month it is. So that when I go fishing, I'm going to catch a fish. Okay, because I have studied this fish to the point that when I go out there, I got it. So, what does that have to do with these guys going out in this boat? This is what you have to understand. When he starts to speak, he said, we've fished all night long and we've caught nothing. First off, there is a problem here. That they went fishing. If you're a fisherman and you provide for your family through selling fish, by eating fish, by cooking fish, this whole deal, when you come back with no fish, you have a problem. Okay, when those nets are empty, we have a problem. So what does Jesus say? He says, I know you've been fishing all night. Go out into the water. So they have a problem. But there is a bigger problem here to his buddies back at the shore. You don't catch fish during the day, not the kind of fishing that they're doing. You see, they're letting down a net, but the net is only so far. And the fish that they're fishing for eat at night. Why? Because the same principle as the striper, the, the bait fish come in, and they're able to net these things. Well, during the day, the fish go deep down into the water. They're at the bottom to where the nets are not going to catch anything. So for Jesus to actually be saying, go out into that deep water and put down your nets. To him, he's saying, we did this all night long. We're, we're not going to catch fish. They're not there. So for there to be two overflowing boats with fish, are you now seeing how big of a situation this is? This is absolutely amazing. It's so amazing that he's blown away by it. His buddies are blown away by it. And we don't know him as Simon anymore. We know him as Peter. Because when they came back to the shore, he put down his notes, his nets, he put down the boat, and he followed Jesus. You see what I'm saying here? So what's actually taking place here is amazing. He didn't stop and say, go build me a boat. He didn't say, go build a table. He said, I'll go out and do it. And by that obedience, this amazing situation happened that changed their lives forever. This amazing situation took place that changed their lives forever. Jesus will do that. He'll ask you to do something that is contrary to what you're used to doing. He will ask you to do something that does not make any sense to you. But when you go out into that deep water, that deep water is called the unknown for us. It's where we're amazed by what Jesus can do. You see, when he pulls you out into that deep water and you get out of your comfort zone, you start reading the word, you start praying, he starts speaking to you, and you start being obedient to it, he's able to do this amazing thing to where your life completely changes and you begin to follow him. You see where this obedience comes in where he says, come and follow me. He's saying, come, come and follow me. Listen to what I'm saying. When you're obedient, you can rest in confidence. When you're obedient, you can rest in confidence. Listen to this. When you go to college and you take a class and you follow the syllabus and you do everything that they tell you to do, you've seen that person that they say, hey, I need to go to bed early. I've got a test tomorrow. Can I tell you those words have never come out of my mouth? Come on, boys, we're pulling an all-nighter. We need to hop online. We need to call up everything we know. We're going to cram like this thing for crazy, and hopefully we'll get a C. But the person who was obedient and followed the syllabus and did everything that it was supposed to do, they're like, I'm going to bed early, and they go in the next day, and they nail it. They hit it out the park. They're obedient in it. You know, earlier we were talking about boot camp and we were talking about the military and I wanted it to be everything that they designed it to be. I was a gunner's mate missile tech. I got on the USS Winston S. Churchill. It was a pre-com. They built it from nothing and it went out for sea trials. And that ship was involved in shock trials. For you guys who are not familiar with what this is, they take 300, uh, 10, what is it, 10,000 pounds of TNT. That's what it is, 10,000 pounds of TNT. They take it off. You go off into the ocean. They take it so far off the boat, and they explode this stuff. Now, the first one, it's so far away that when it explodes, you just go, boop, little shake, you're fine. 
A couple days later, you go out there, and they bring that 10,000 pounds closer. Boom! You're shaking a lot. The last one, they bring it 100 yards away, 300 feet, 10,000 pounds of TNT. And when they ignite this stuff, there is literally a gap. This is amazing. There is a gap between a boat and the water. But we're talking about a destroyer. It is insane to see. Now, when this one goes off, the place catches on fire. Toilets break. There's flooding, complete chaos. It's insanity. What's going on around you is chaos. But if you watch the people on that boat, you're watching something that is amazing to see. You're watching to see people immediately kick into everything that they were taught. In complete obedience, they put out the fires, they mop up the floor. Everything that could have happened, completely overted. Why? Obedience. Just being obedient in everything that we had been taught to that moment, we were able to handle that situation. It's in obedience that we are able to handle the things that come flying at us. It's an obedience by resting, by saying sharp. Here's the thing about rest. Roger would use an illustration all the time about sharpening your axe. And the story actually goes that two uh, lumberjacks go out into the woods. They're chopping, chopping, chopping. Every day at about lunchtime, the one uh, lumberjack goes off and takes, doesn't come back for an hour and a half. And every day at the end of the day, he's chopped more wood than the one that went all day long. And finally, he came to him and was like, how can you chop so much wood? And he says, oh, I go out there and I sharpen the blade. So he stops and he rests. What I liken it to is I've scraped way more floors than I've needed to in this last year. And I actually have to do some here in the next week. Tony, you can relate to this. By the way, Danny, your floors look amazing. <laughs> when you're scraping floors, you have a razor blade. The one area you do not want to save money is on that blade. You want to flip that blade over, keep scraping. Flip the blade over, keep scraping. Throw the blade away, get another blade, start scraping. And the job is going to go so much smoother, so much easier. When you take that rest, that's what you're doing. When you're disconnecting, when you're taking the physical rest, when you're taking the mental rest, you're able to stop and you're able to get everything done a lot faster, a lot easier. There's not a struggle. Let's talk about the last kind of rest. The last kind of rest we were talking about was the rest for the soul. And it's found in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble and heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. When you first come to Jesus, when you look at, there's a lot of people that would look at Christianity and say, I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm not giving up the lifestyle that I live. I'm just not going to follow those things. It looks really, really heavy. But here is the thing, that Jesus Christ wants what's best for you. He wants what's best for you, and he knows if you do these things, if you take these steps, he knows what the outcome is going to be. Can I tell you that I talk to Pastor Roger all the time, which, by the way, I want you to come back, especially if you're new. I want you to come back next week and hear this man preach, okay? I absolutely love this man. He's a hero of mine. He's my pastor. He's a mentor. Love this guy. Can't say enough. And one of the things I say to him all the time when I listen to his preaching my wife and I searched for a church all over the Hampton Roads area. And we would walk out of the churches, and I would say, it's just missing something. Something's not there. And when I walked in here, I was like, there it is. And I tell him all the time that if you continue preaching what you're preaching, God will bring the lost. You have to understand that the things that are being preached here and taught here may be difficult to hear. They may be hard to swallow. They are what is exactly, absolutely the best for you. We hear these things. You know, I see the emails, which, by the way, if God is working in your life, is if he's changing your heart and your mind, shoot it off in an email. Put it on the connect card. 
It's saying, hey, you guys keep going in the same direction that you're going. Because God is moving and he is working. We know that Rosina and Mike are the nicest people on the planet. Tell us how your, your life is being changed. I see the changes in this place. I'm blown away by the changes that are taking place in this place. Seeing people to make a decision to handle finances and change the way that they spend money and save money because they don't want to live in that slavery and trap that they've been in. People making a decision that says, you know what, I'm going to leave my family and I'm going to go off to school. And I watch God start to move. And I see a peace fall upon the situation. Can I tell you that Jesus is with you and he sees you in this. He sees you in everything that you are doing. There are people that are struggling with diseases right now. And I want you to know that Jesus is with you, that he is beside you. I know that in the middle of the night, it's going to hurt to not see those little boys. And I want you to know in that moment, Jesus is with you, Kirsten. I want you to know that God is moving. He is charging hearts and he is changing minds. And it's through hearing the word and doing something with it. You wouldn't take your computer when the battery's going down put it next to the wall without plugging it in. You wouldn't take your car to a gas station and not pump gas. You guys are coming into this place. You're hearing the word of the Lord, and you're doing what it's saying to do. And God is moving and working. That's what he does because he knows what's best for you. I read the Bible with, my, with Logan and Liam and Lily. And I'm blown away when this is what happened. My wife comes in and says, Logan's been sitting up all night. And I'm sitting there going, how do you get that game in there? Because I know I grabbed it. And she said, no, Tommy, he's got the Bible in his hand. Listen to me. There's not a prouder moment than that. It's when my little, little, littlest Liam takes a picture at school and he won't put down the Bible. So they take a picture of him with the Bible. And I'm like, yes! God, why do I do that every night? Because I know what's best for them. I have what's, what I have in mind for them is what's best for them. And I want you to know that that's what Jesus wants for you. When I came to Jesus, there were so many decisions that I had to make. And so many things that I thought were too hard for me. I lived the way the world lived. I did what the world did. And I see your decisions and your commitments. And I say, keep going. Rest in the Lord in it. I know it's hard. You don't know what it's going to be like. What if I stop doing this? What is this going to be like this? It's going to be amazing. Let me promise you that. That on the back side of it, if you hear from the Lord and you do what he says, it's going to be amazing. You have to make that decision, and then you have to do something. You have to rest in it. You have to say, I have faith and trust in Jesus, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Jesus sees you. So this morning, you might be saying, well, how do I apply this? As you leave here today, am I saying, um, I want you to rest your mind, body, and soul? Yeah. Yep, all those. Do I want you to rest in what God has done? Yes. Do I want you to rest from what you've done? Yes. Do I want you to rest in what Jesus is doing? Yes. You see, the rest that Jesus is talking about is a rest that has no end. It's constant. It's a peace that when you trust in him, you will be at rest. That There is peace for your soul. And I want you to see this before we close this morning. The reason that I talked about what God did in each day, I want you to notice this. The first day, light was created. This was the beginning of time. Jesus is talking about a peace and a rest that does not end. The beginning of the time, God has created all things, and then he rested. I want you to hear what it says. Like I said, you can go back and check this. The first day, light was created. And there was evening and there was morning, 
the first day. The second day, the sky was created, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. The third day, dry land seas, plants, and trees were created. There was evening, there was morning the third day. The fourth day, the sun, the moon, and the stars were created. There was evening, there was morning the fourth day. The fifth day, the creatures that live in the sea and creatures that fly were created. There was evening, there was morning the fifth day. The sixth day, animals that live on the land and finally humans made the image of God were created. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The seventh day, God rested. If you go back and, re and read it, it doesn't say there was evening and morning the seventh day. It says God rested. It's a rest that continues. It's the same rest that Jesus is talking about when you come to him. What I'm asking you for is to apply this to your life and your every day. I'm asking you to rest on that day, the Sabbath. I'm asking you to rest in that moment. I'm asking you to rest in your decision. I'm asking you to rest in Jesus Christ church. And I promise you, he has what is best for you. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, this morning, we just thank you. We thank you for this season. We thank you for this time of family and being able to rest. We thank you for your word, Lord God, that there is a rest that we can all achieve, that we can all have, and it is in you. I ask that this morning that you touch hearts that you reinsure hearts, that you lift up those who are tired, that they are weary, that they are broken. And I ask that you give them rest. We turn to you for our rest and for all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.